Okay, this video is what are the best and worst medical subspecialties? Uh, a couple of general questions. What doctors are the shortest? Peds, it's easier to stand out in that crowd if you're short. What doctors are the tallest? Probably ortho, a lot of former athletes. What doctors are the skinniest? Probably cardiology. I kind of laugh. A lot of cardiologists, <laughs> they've seen a lot of people die. They know the truth. Many of them know the truth about nutrition uh, and health and they exercise a lot. Um, and they don't, they don't want a stent for themselves. They know stents are very overrated, except for acute myocardial infarction context. PMR, PMR, you know, physical medicine rehab doctors, they see stroke patients all day, every day. So that's a big motivator to exercise a lot and get fit. Um, what internal medicine subspecialty is the nerdiest pulmonary? Like the pocket protector brigade, they're, you know, they're always talking about ventilator settings and stuff. So, you know, I like them. They're kind of funny. A lot of them, you know, run an ICU or something like that. Um, also, you notice I'm playing, uh, I'm doing something new with these letters here. See these highlighted in yellow areas? This is something, I think it's called bionic reading technique. And what they did was you just highlight the first letter or a couple of letters in a word and a person could read that a lot faster. It's, it, it takes a lot of time to write it that way, but isn't that interesting? Look at all the ones where the first letter is in bold, and look at the one where it's not. It's so much easier to read it when the first letter is in bold. Uh, so that's an interesting thing for future consideration. Well, it'd be nice to read an entire book like that. Apparently, it dramatically speeds up the rate at which one could read. Okay, what surgical subspecialty is the nerdiest? ENT, they're the most intellectual of the surgeons. I know lots of them. I talk to them all the time. Uh, what doctors have the least skill with English? So the ones that have to talk to the patient the least, which is probably anesthesiology, pathology, maybe radiology. And you know, some of them will have funny accents. I remember this one lady, uh, she, she's like, I think she was Russian, something Slavic. She couldn't say the word breath. And you know, it's a common thing in medicine to tell the patient, hold your breath. You'd all say, hold your breast. And we all would start laughing. And another one, this was an Asian anesthesiologist, real nice lady, but she couldn't say the word move. So she would always say to the patient, you know, when the patient's waking up post anesthesiology, they want to make sure they can move their hands and legs. You know, they didn't have a stroke or something. You say, "Can you move? Can you move?" And the patient go, "Move?" <laughs> and he goes, "No, move your arm like windshield wiper." That's a lot of fun. Um. So, anyways, you know, anesthesiology. If the patient's asleep, you don't need to be too articulate to talk to them. Uh, but if you go into pain medicine, then you got to talk a lot. Uh, let's see, radiology. If you go into interventional, you got to talk a lot. What doctors have the biggest egos. Neurosurgery, you got to have a big ego to go into neurosurgery. Neurosurgery is such a terrible lifestyle. There's so many bad things about it. Unless you have this giant ego and think the greatest thing in the world is to be a neurosurgeon, there's no way you're going to put up with that. Uh, okay, what's the joke? How do you hide a million dollars from an internist? You put it under a, a, a surgical bandage, okay? Because they're, they tend to be really wimpy and, you know, don't want to touch anything. Um, don't have procedure skills. Okay, how do you hide a million dollars from a neurosurgeon? You tape it to his kid's head. And the joke is, they're always in the hospital. Like the neurosurgery resident, <clears throat> they work some of the longest hours. They come in on weekends all the time. It's like one of the worst fields in medicine. Okay, uh, what about a cardiologist? You know, the joke is you can't, it can't be done. That they kind of have the, the association of being, you know, money hungry and greedy. But, you know, a lot of them are pretty nice. But anyways, what's, what's the best place to work if you're a doctor? Best place to work is a university hospital in a rural state. And the reason is you'll have a short commute. The commutes are really long to work in uh, popular big city areas because that's where everybody is. So there's tons of traffic. Um, the salaries are high in the rural state because not many people live there or want to go there. Most people want to stay where their families are, so they stay near the big cities. And because of that, there's a lot of competition for the job, so salaries are low. And the cost of living is high. It's a double screw job versus if you're out in a rural state. High salaries, short commute, low cost of living. Um, and then if you're at a university hospital, your kids go to school there for free. So you save tons of money. I mean, if I could do it all over again, I'd be at a rural state, um, university hospital with a wrestling team program. I could coach wrestling. That would have been uh, perfect for me uh, if I had had the sense to figure that out in advance. What is the best place? Okay, we just talked about that. What are the best medical specialty? That means internal medicine subspecialty. Dermatology probably, but it's real hard to get into. I mean, that's a walk in the park, okay? What do you do? You just scrape, skin and, scrape skin and give steroids, okay? It's a piece of cake, and it's well paid, and people people like talking to dermatologists. So they're, they're, they're sort of socially popular at a party. Oh, so-and-so is a dermatologist, you know? Um you know, I'm a radiologist. Nobody even can talk to me. <laughs> 
Ah, oh, my wife always tells me if we go to party. Don't say anything. Don't intimidate people. No one wants to hear your big mouth or your vegan diet. Okay. Um, renal. Uh, because control of turf. Uh, no one else knows anything about dialysis machines. So nobody could challenge them for their patients uh, with the dialysis machine. Also, if you're renal, that means nephrologist, almost all your problems you can handle with telephone. So you don't have to go to the hospital. you got pretty good hours, reasonably good pay. I think that's one of the best uh, subspecialties to go into for an easy life. Uh, what are nephrology? Okay, why are they the worst doctors today? Because they're always getting pissed off. Okay, cardiology is big money. And cardiac imaging can be fun if you're doing echocardiography, CT stenting, but... The stents are over are overrated. You get you get a lot of, or if you're just doing regular cardiology, you're going to get lots and lots of emergency calls, which is a pain in the ass. Patient has chest pain, and you have to run over there all the time, so that would not be so fun. Plus, the vegan diet's the best thing. So a lot of cardiologists on the internet, I see them, they're all lying, telling all these people to have olive oil and all this other BS. That's pathetic. Um, vegan diet, Esselstyn diet's by far the best. There's nothing even close to it, but there's no money in it. Rheumatology is interesting and it's easy, but their drugs don't really work very well. The only real good treatment is the diet stuff, but that would be sort of a cakewalk, easy life. Because one of the reasons why you want to look for a field that's a little bit easy in medicine is you can totally be overwhelmed with work. In medicine, they want doctors to just be total workaholics in lots of medical jobs and all the different fields. They're designed to make the doctor have to work extra hours. For example, if somebody is like a clerical staff or you know technical staff they might have a fixed shift you work from eight o'clock to four o'clock but it's not like a doc that, that for doctors a doctor just has to do whatever the work is for the day so they might have to come in early to get the work done stay late to get the work done and everyone's like well you're the doctor that's what you're supposed to do so lots of doctors kind of get railroaded into working very long hours and some of them do it because they're greedy for money but in my experience i've seen tons of them get um pushed into working longer and longer hours. Uh, so if you find a field that's easier, even if you're working harder than you used to for that field, you still can still have some time for a life. Um, emergency medicine doctors, they really help patients a lot because acute problems often respond well to treatment. Uh, so, and they often work, let's say, a week, and then they're off for a week or work two weeks, off for two weeks. So they often will have a lot of vacation time, a lot of free time, the ability to be a doctor half their life and do something else interesting or fun the other half. So all of that is good. The downside of ER is you don't have any protection from the outside world. All kinds of crazy stuff comes their way. Really high stress. I think the medical legal risk is significant. Um, a lot of smelly, disgusting things they have to deal with. Um, so, and they don't get paid that much. Uh, you know, I remember when I was trying to decide what to go into, and I had a couple people advising me. They were like, "No, no, no, don't go into ER. Don't go into ER." Uh, endocrine. Endocrine, I think, would be fun if I if I had to do it all over again. Endocrine might be nice because I could have taken more advantage of my biochemistry background, and um, a lot of stuff they deal with is pretty easy. Diabetes, lots of thyroid nodule follow-ups and autoimmune disease for thyroid. Most of them don't know hardly anything about uh, biochemistry diabetes. I was amazed in my conversations with them how little they know. It's it's like bizarre. It's almost like, didn't you guys have to study? <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what do you study for your boards if you don't know anything about uh, you know biochemistry and pathophysiology? It's kind of strange. Uh, lots of people want to go to them for testosterone cream and all that kind of stuff. So, you know... Uh, to do research in endocrine would be fun. Psychiatry is real interesting to read about, all these mental illnesses and diseases and how the brain works. But in real life, the drugs don't really work. The drugs are actually toxic, I think, tend to make the patients worse. There's not much money from just talk therapy with patients for a psychiatrist, so that's a bit of a downside. My father's a psychiatrist, but he actually and he absolutely loved it. But as I got older, I realized that was pretty different than my dad. He was a good man. He did the best he could, but... I think for me, I would be bored out of my mind in psychiatry. Preventive occupational medicine sounds good. I would like to help patients prevent problems, but I don't know if you can get paid. I don't even know anybody that does that. That's kind of a really rare specialty. Gastroenterology is a popular medicine subspecialty, and I know a lot of GI doctors. They often have fun personalities, but I wouldn't want to smell poop every day. Um, and I've been surprised. Most of them don't know much about diet, surprisingly. That really surprised me, but most of them don't. 
Uh, geriatrics is easy and there's lots of patients. So it might be boring. You might feel like this is a waste of my life. and But it'd be a pretty easy thing. You make your money, you just kind of do the same repetitive things. A lot of demented patients in nursing homes. What are the worst medical subspecialties? Okay, I would find oncology one of the worst because I like a lot of oncologists. They're pretty smart, real articulate, but chemo doesn't work that well. It's kind of depressing. So many people dying all the time. Uh, internal medicine is turning into checklist, checkbox medicine, you know, and so I think a lot of internal medicines, you know, I know some that are pretty smart. They must be bored out of their mind, you know, the same stuff all day, every day. And, you know, what they really need to do is, is recommend and learn more about plant-based diet, but there's no money in it. So that's kind of a screw job in medicine whereby the thing that actually really works doesn't get reimbursed. So they kind of get pressure to just, you know, deal drugs. Okay, what are the best surgical subspecialties? Um, ophthalmology, I think, is great because they have they can often restore a person's vision. They got one of the highest cure rates uh, in medicine. You know, give a person a pair of glasses, they can see well. Okay, it works. Um, it's not BS like so much in medicine. They make big money and have good hours. So opto is one of the hardest fields to get into. I didn't like looking into a person's eye though, putting my face next to somebody's face and looking in their eye. It was hard to do those ophthalmoscopes. So that was one of the things that turned me off from optho. Um, ENT, you know, the joke of ENT is that means early noon tennis. Intellectually, it's satisfying. They have a lot of surgical procedures, a lot of clinical work, but it's also kind of disgusting, you know, having your face up close to someone else's face and uh, looking in their mouth and their nose all the time, dealing with all the tracheostomies. You know, the public has this perception that being a doctor is glamorous. Actually, it's not that glamorous, not at all um, in general. It's not like all these TV shows, okay? Um, and some of the reasons why I say that is the people who get sick all the time, they're not, you know, like the college graduate smart set that watches all these academic videos. The people who get sick all the time are alcoholics, drug addicts, demented pa patients, you know, real irresponsible patients, really stupid people. Uh, so a doctor spends a tremendous amount of time talking to drug addicts, alcoholics, uh, with working with demented patients. So that's not that glamorous. Okay. My whole life I dated only one nurse and that was only for a brief amount of time. Okay. And she was sort of like, you know, it's like, you know, I'm like, I'm looking for a wife, somebody to have my kids for me and to take care of my kids in my house. You know, and yeah, sure, you say, oh, we want to be equal partners and share everything and have a conversation. Yeah, right. And, you know, that's, you know, something in the movies. But anyways, um, let's see, what else? All right. Um, urology, big money among surgical subspecialties. It's real easy to learn. Um, the urologists I've known, a lot of them are pretty nice with a good sense of humor. So I like them. As a field, it's also kind of disgusting. Do you want to be looking at people's dicks all day and putting a tube up their Johnson? I don't, I don't really want to do that. Plastic surgery is big money. It's a lot of glamour. It's hard to get into. Plastic surgeons are like the rock stars in the medical world. Women throw themselves at the feet of plastic surgeons. Okay. So um, it's a long residency, though. I knew this plastic surgeon. He would go out with women that were 15 years younger than him and beautiful, okay? And and he would just dump them. I thought that was amazing, okay? There's no other field like that. It's like being a rock star. Um, it's a long residency. There's a high risk of needle sticks. You're working with all these tiny needles. Um, and uh, some of the patients are very crazy. One of my uncles was a plastic surgeon. He was shot and killed by a crazy patient. Um, what else was a problem? There's other problem with plastic surgery. Oh, when I was growing up, you know, I could have gone into plastic surgery. My father strongly discouraged it. He said, ah, oh, they're just like prostitutes, you know, and they had no, and I had some other uncles that are doctors. None of them had any respect for plastic surgeons, but I'm thinking in retrospect now, plastic surgeon actually does what the patient wants. The patient says she wants, you know, the Turner headlights and the high beams. He goes, sure, here you go. And then she pays him for it. So he get he does what he's paid to do um, and that's kind of nice. Whereas most other medicines all totally through insurance companies and it's not that clear how the payment works. Um, so plastic surgeon says, oh, you want to be skinnier? Fine. Here's the liposuction. Okay. So I actually think it's a better field now than I used to. Um, and also some of them get very rich and you know, that would be nice. You could retire sooner. Uh, let's see. Ortho. <clears throat> Ortho was fun. I almost went into ortho. You know, as an athlete, I liked hanging around with athletes. And the best thing about ortho is, in comparison with the other surgical subspecialties, is 
Ortho just deals with the bones. Bone break, must fix. You know, they get mocked as being stupid, but they don't have to deal with things that are rather tedious and unpleasant. For example, when I, I did a surgical internship, I call my ortho attending. I go, oh, the patient's sodium is low. And he, he would say to me, ask me if I give a shit. He goes, call the internist who manages that sort of stuff. So there would be an internist on console that would handle everything like the sodium, the potassium, or whatever other medical issue there was. And the orthopod, you know, didn't have to bother with it. So when I walked around on rounds with ortho, they're all cracking jokes and they're real funny. They were fun to be around, okay? And that's totally different than one of the worst surgical subspecialties is going to be general surgery. We had all these people who were dying in the intensive care unit. They're constantly working super long hours, lots of emergencies at night, um, working with stool all the time. It's kind of smelling disgusting. Um, so ortho was, I thought, so much more fun of a field to go into than general surgery. Um, what is bad about ortho? They work with a lot. There's blood aerosolized all the time when you're drilling into bones. Uh, you know, at the time I was coming out of my training, people were worried about HIV. All the HIV patients used to die pretty fast. Um, in the trauma cases, they get blood all over themselves. I've seen several orthopods stick themselves with needles or with saws during amputations and stuff. So it was kind of a big mess, and I didn't really like that, especially at the time when everyone was worried about HIV. Um, infertility is a hot new field. Tons and tons of people. There's infertility is off the charts. And, you know, I studied the toxicology of what's going into food and other things. And I'm telling you, infertility is only going to keep going up, 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 up. So that's a great field to get into. I think there's going to be more and more work for them to do. Pain medicine. Pain medicine, on the one hand, a lot of anesthesiologists don't like anesthesia. So they go into pain for that reason. But there's problems with pain medicine. There's a lot of turf issues. A lot of people want to do pain medicine. PMR docs want to do pain medicine. Some neurologists want to do pain medicine. Uh, so they can have competition for their patients. In addition, um, there's a lot of drug addicts that are always want them to prescribe drugs. I ran a spinal injection clinic for a while. And it was because an anesthesiologist had left at one of the places where I worked. And so I, I did all the epidural steroids and everything related to that, selective nerve root blocks, you name it. But the patients kept calling me, oh, can you prescribe me drugs? And I'm like, no, 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 no. And um, I didn't prescribe any of that stuff. Uh, but what happened was then an anesthesiologist came to one of the places I was at, and they're like, oh, could we please do some of the pain cases? I said, you can have them all. I wanted to get out of pain medicine. I, I didn't like being bothered with those patient phone calls all the time. And it was always the same thing. Can you inject me again sooner than I told them? Or can you prescribe me opioids? And I didn't prescribe any drugs. I mean, I, my background's coming from radiology, so I didn't have anything to do with that. I just did the injection procedures, but the patients mistakenly would call me all the time. And I was just like, don't bother me. Um, and they, would, they wouldn't get it. They would call you, they'd say, well, can you inject me again? I was just injected, you know, six weeks ago. I'm like, well, no, our policy is you have to wait three months or four months, depending on what we did. And they would constantly call me all these every two weeks. And I didn't have like a physician assistant or nurse to take all those calls. So it was kind of time consuming. What are the worst medical sub, I don't say, what are the worst surgical subspecialties? Neurosurgery, I'd say, is the worst. I mean, I, I know a lot of neurosurgeons and I like them. I do the best I can to try to help them out, but I feel sorry for them. Really long hours. They get called in on the weekend all the time. You know, drunk drivers get in motor vehicle accidents and they get into cranial bleeds. They got to drain the subdural hematomas. They have lots of lawsuits because, you know, people have high expectations. There's not much you could do with the brain when it's messed up, okay? No matter what the neurosurgeon does, you know, taking out a brain tumor. They still have a poor prognosis with a glioblastoma multiforme, for example. And it's kind of sad, all these stroked out patients. When I rotated through neurosurgery as an intern, it was just kind of depressing. Um, vascular surgery is easy to learn. Everything's logical. It makes sense. Um, technically, it's very difficult to do. Vascular surgeons have fantastic technique, uh, but I would be bored out of my mind. It's totally repetitive, and I wouldn't want to be doing all these stent cases, you know, as, as you get older. When you're kind of young, you know, you're 30 years old, it's exciting to do this big, massive, complex procedure. But when you're older, you know, you want to help the patients, but you want to go home in a reasonable time. You got a family or you got a research project on the side. You don't want to be you know, in the hospital at two o'clock in the morning, especially. So anyways, vascular surgeons are constantly getting called in the middle of the night. Um, so for those reasons, I wouldn't like it. Uh, OB is kind of screwed. 
because OB, obstetrics doctor because they have really they have like the worst hours. They get a phone call. They got to be in delivery. You know they have they work a shift of course, but they have really terrible hours. Lots of lawsuits. So I wouldn't want to do OB for that reason. Even though delivering babies is a lot of fun. It's a joyful moment. Um, they get a lot of hassles. I know I've known a lot of OB doctors got sued. I mean I don't know that many OB doctors, but the ones I know they've all been sued. Okay. Um, by the way, as far as radiology specialty, I'll give that in a separate lecture because that's a more detailed topic for me. Uh, so why do, okay, here's just a couple of jokes. Why do surgeons make the best husbands? Because they're workaholics. They work all day and then the wife just gets to spend all their money. Um, it used to be back when I was in my training days, like the big surgical programs like Duke, they would brag about how high their divorce rate was. But it's kind of a screw job. And I think it's very easy for men who are workaholics to be turned into slaves whereby they're working all the time and then their wife says, oh, you take me for granted and she divorces them. So they're still going to have to work all the time and give her money for nothing. And then on top of it, um, they got to support their their new future wife or family or whatever. I've seen that happen to a couple guys. I had a male doctor friend of mine and he wanted to buy a nicer house in a nicer neighborhood. So he started working a moonlighting job and then his wife cheated on him and said, you take me for granted. And he's like, what the hell? And then he has to pay double alimony because of his moonlighting job. So that's one of the reasons why I never you know, went down that path. Um, the easiest way to make money is marry a healthy person. I've seen these divorced doctor guys, basically their ex-wives turn them into slaves because they have to keep on giving their ex-wife money, but they don't really get much out of it. They don't even get to see their kids hardly ever. Um, it's really bad. And, and it ruins the finances of the family. So I, I have doctor friends who... They've been divorced and they've lost all the children's college savings. They lost their homes. Uh, it's a disaster. Uh, in retrospect, if I could do it all over again, yeah, I wish I did more research and teaching because, you know, there's such a thing I think is like what's the best IQ for a doctor. And so you want to be a little bit smarter than average for your field or maybe in the top 10% academically, intellectually for your field. But if you're way beyond that, it's like you got all this extra brain energy and then what are you going to do with it it'd be fun to do research it's fun to teach um and again i wish i was near a place where it would be easier to exercise and i would love to coach wrestling part-time on the side if i could do it all over anyways hope this helps